My name is Eva Kolisch. My name is Naomi Roplansky. What are some issues that concern you today? What are some of the things that you're, you're uh, worried about or interested in or engaged with today? At that time, today? Yeah. Oh, I'm engaged. Of course, I'm a feminist. It's very engaged. Still am in feminism, women's movement. I'm anti-war to the core, and uh, I've been in many demonstrations, I've been arrested, and uh, it's a, a horror that they don't know how to think of anything else except militarization. And I have met and had wonderful friends in the peace movement. Well, I guess the things that have concerned me all my life that it's some people are poor and some are rich, <laughs> and the, any well, you know, it's a catchword now, inequality. But that's certainly been one of my themes all since I was a kid. Uh, the other, the other thing is the color, the civil rights, uh, you know, the oppression of the blacks, which obsessed me all. It's all my life, uh -huh. I would say. Can we get you to tell the story of how you met one more time? If that's <laughs> Maybe I'll start this. You can start. I'll finish. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it was a, an afternoon at Sarah Lawrence at my college, and Grace had a car, Grace Peely. She said, Eva, you want to come with me? <laughs> I'm giving a reading at the, the gay something something, gay, the, the gay women's something something. And uh, Grace, of course, knew that I was a lesbian. And I said to myself, of course I must go with her, but really I wanted to go home. I was so tired and I had a kid and my boy. But I said, okay, I'll come. We went to this gathering in the church on 70... Universal uh -huh. Church, 76th and uh -huh. Columbus. Unitarian. Unitarian. Right. And it was quite crowded. I saw some people I knew in the front row, but as I walked in, I noticed this woman on the left sitting near the, near the, hall, near the corridor. And she looked so beautiful and so interesting. And she was talking to the person next to her, so I said, oh. well, I said, I would go and see, try to see her in intermission. And I don't know if there was an intermission, but the first pause, somebody else, but one of my comrades from the peace movement said, there's some, someone I'd like you to meet in the front row. I said, I'm sorry, but I have to go back to the back row. <laughs> Joe, you love this woman, she's California. I said, I need to see this person who's probably a New Yorker. I went back and there was Naomi reading. What are you reading? And she told me. Yosunar. Uh, oh, oh, I had never Margaret read. Yosunar. I had never read her. Uh -huh. uh, somehow. Interesting. And I said, Yosunar, I know that name, but I've never read her. <laughs> and then before you knew it, we were talking. And she was very interested in German literature. German culture, I mean the good Germans, and we talked in German a little, and uh, then she said, do you have a student who can come and give me lessons? I said, I can give you lessons. <laughs> 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 and she said, oh no, I can't accept that, but she did. She did. We, we met a few weeks later, and uh, I visited her at her house, a tiny house with many books. And we started German a little. And then she came to my house. And then I realized it's not just about German. I mean, I knew right away it's about everything. Oh. It's about everything. This woman has captivated me. And what captivated me was her, her being there. She was there so authentically. So really, she's beautiful, that goes without saying, but she was so honest in her talking, her thinking, 
I said, oh my God, I got I got to get to know this woman. And then I called her. No, she called me a few days later, and I was up, had already wanted to call her. But my therapist said, don't rush, don't rush. <laughs> <laughs> So I reluctantly waited a few days, and then she called me, and I said, oh, I was just going to call you. I want to see you. <laughs> and we made a date. You left out, you left out Grace's role there. Oh, Grace, from, at the, <laughs> Grace at came the along. Read, at the reading. She, Grace saw me talking to Naomi, and she said, oh, do you know her? Get a phone number. <laughs> <laughs> The poem is called An Inheritance. Five dollars, four dollars, three dollars, two, one, and none, and what do we do? This is the worry that never got said, but ran so often in my mother's head, and showed so plain in my father's frown, that to us kids it drifted down. It drifted down like soot, like snow, in the dream-tossed Bronx, in the, young, in the long ago. I shook it off with a shake of the head. I bounced my ball. I ate warm bread. I skated down the steepest hill. But I must have listened against my will. When the wind blows wrong, I can hear it today. Then my mother's worry stops all play, and as if in its rightful place, my father's frown divides my face. I think I was a political person long before when I was a child. I see. I was very aware of social problems and social injustice and very aware of very poor people. And we were not poor, we were quite middle class. And, uh, and I was discriminated against as a Jew. And they were discriminated against for being poor. That's where, that's where I came from, from Vienna, Austria. And uh, my brothers and I got out in 1939. June or July 1939 to get to England to safety because very shortly after that no children could get out anymore because the war had broadened and uh, it was both exciting and traumatic and we got bought a ship very hard to get it was just near the end of any passage. And we came to the US to Staten Island on a long, long trip. But it was wonderful to be on the way to our parents. Oh, I went to high school in Staten Island and I had a couple of years of very uh, sort of uninteresting years <coughs> in high school. But it was safe. Nobody beat me up and nobody called me a Jew bastard or anything like that. And then toward the end of my second year, I met a bunch of Trotskyists. And uh, they ma made a big impression on me. Of course, I didn't know Trotskyists from Stalinists at that time. I didn't know the whole history. But I liked them very much with Stanley and with this original training in Trotskyism, Marxism, Socialism, I found a kind of a home, an intellectual home, and a home for my own sense of injustice and wanting to, to make things right, making them okay. And they were far from okay. And then I stayed in what we called the movement, until the end of the war. But I was out in Detroit in the factory Dodge truck. 
I was proud to be in the UAW. Uh -huh. I went to all the meetings. My job was to put windshield wipers on the jeeps, and I loved it because it was so. Uh -huh. And I was a fast worker, and later on I was told to slow down because you don't want to walk too fast because that's anti-union, if you know what I mean. But I was also shocked to work in a factory, shocked by it, by the tedium uh -huh. and by the, uh, uh, the sort of jocular but very obnoxious uh, relation between the men and the women. Uh -huh. All about sexual, sexual jokes and hey, baby, let me, uh, blah, blah, and, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> just went on and on. Factory poem. The tool bit cut, the metal curled, the oil soaked through her clothing. She made 600 parts a day and timed herself by breathing. And what she made and where it went, she did not ask or wonder. Gone to rust or to machines of pleasure or of murder. She dared not quit. She had seen those who fought like jackals over the carcass of a rotting job in cold depression weather as if each payday would repay, as if she lived forever. She wished away the newborn week and wished the daylight over. Evening bell, you I longed for, with such restless longing, come straighten my shoulders and deliver my hands. After the war, I felt I was so ignorant, you know, I mean, I really didn't know. I knew Marxism, but <laughs> I didn't know anything. I was uneducated. I went to Brooklyn College, which was very good at that time, and I spent uh, my four years there and got a BA. And then I got married, and I had a child, and I was divorced. And I then said, I must become an academic because my mind is, can be academic if, if it wants to be. And uh, it's a, not a bad life. And I would have vacations with my son. I could I'd see more of my child. So I worked very hard to become a, an educated person. And uh, I did more or less. After I was at Brooklyn College for a couple of years, there was an opening at Sarah Lawrence, and I was invited to come and apply. And I heard about the school, and I said, this sounds like a snobbish school. This sounds like a rich girl's school. I don't know if I can take that. And my chairman said, do it. Do it for the experience, for a year or two. So I went, and I got there, and I loved it. It was a wonderful school. The girls were wonderful. And uh, I didn't know education could be like that, so intense and yet so friendly and so... So out of the one year, two years, I stayed 30 years. Uh -huh. And sometimes I felt I shouldn't be teaching in a school of such privilege because, uh, you know, most people don't have that privilege. And I felt guilty, but... At the same time, I did so much to wake up these girls, and I taught them. And then the, the anti-war movement started, and I was very involved with that. Demonstrations, getting arrested. <coughs> and my students, who liked me very much, followed, and they went on the demonstrations. They became radical. So I figured I wasn't just goofing off, you know. <laughs> you say to young women today in the way of <laughs> I advice? Am, I envy you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I envy the I envy their. Uh, First of all, I envy the f physically. I envy them that because they can do so much more than <laughs> I could do when I was their age. I mean, f just physically, the muscles, you know, and are uh, developed. <laughs> and um, I envy them this kind of certainty they have of uh, that the feminist movement has really created in the past. How many years? Not very, not many. Not very many years. I mean, just you know, if if you study people in the street, there's such a difference. The way people walk, for example, tall young women walk tall. It used to be that tall young women <laughs> walk like this. Well, I've had a lot of young women as my students, and. I've sometimes meet young women, maybe because of my, 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 my nephews, my family, they bring girlfriends around. And, well, at first I try to impress them <laughs> and intimidate them a little. <laughs> and then I usually like them very much. And I, what I have to contribute is to say, it's not bad for you right now. You're having jobs, and you, but there are still many things that are wrong. And even this job security is not that great because women will be the first in a depression. Women will be the first to go, or there are various prejudices against women still in the labor movement, and there's a ceiling where we can't cross. So don't be, don't be so defensive of the system. It's okay, but it's not really okay. It needs more militancy and more consciousness. And otherwise, women have wonderful virtues, and you have some of them develop them. And what do I mean by that? I mean the body and soul. 